You're listening to The Roundup Podcast, a podcast on reaching the college campus, developing leaders, and sending out kingdom multipliers. This podcast is created by the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention and provided through cooperative program giving. Well, howdy, friends, and welcome to the Roundup Podcast. I am your host, Mitch Tidwell. I am excited about our show today. We're going to talk navigating faith in politics, which can be a pretty polarizing topic and even brings up a lot uh, for folks figuring out where are they even at when it comes to politics, what should they say, how should they feel, and how should they lead their ministries in the midst of a political election year. And so today we brought on Marshall Perry, who I'm going to introduce here in just a second, but I just want to give a preface to this show today is that with politics, there becomes a lot of thoughts, opinions, and emotions, and and we're going to ask talk to Marshall today about navigating that as an individual ministry leader and how that also kind of feeds into your ministry. And so what I would say today is we, we're, we're not bashing anybody, we're not saying one side is right, one side is wrong, but uh, what I do ask as the host of the show that you listen to this with an open mind and heart and realize that even if we have disagreements, uh, we are all part of the kingdom of God and we all are working together for the sake of the great commission. And so I hope you enjoy this podcast. Marshall's a super interesting guy who's uh, turned into be a good friend of mine, and I'm excited to have him on the show. Well, howdy, friends, and welcome to the Roundup Podcast. I am your host, Mitch Tidwell. Thanks for joining us today. I'm super pumped about our show today. We're going to talk navigating faith and politics, and I brought on today a friend of mine, Marshall Perry. Marshall, how's it going, my man? Good, Mitch. How are you? Man, I'm doing really well. This is good. Most of our interaction is on Twitter, so getting you on the podcast right. here, this is this is pretty sweet. So, man, glad to have you on. Marshall is the uh, Missional Communities Director at Austin Stone, the downtown congregation. Uh, Marshall and I actually got connected. Uh, Marshall was uh, serving as the Interim College Director there at Austin Stone. Got to know each other, do some events together there, and uh, and then he uh, took on this role of Missional Communities Director. Well, Marshall, tell us a little bit about yourself, man, before we kind of dive into to navigating faith uh, or politics and faith or faith and politics, however you want to look at it, and um, so we can kind of get to know you, bro. Love it. Yep. Like you said, you nailed my name, Marshall Perry. Not that anybody ever mispronounces that. Dude, what is, um, what is your middle name? Please tell me it's like Wyatt or just something like really good guess. Western. Uh, it is Raymond. Raymond. I would have. Yeah. I always picture Raymond with something about Raymond. So, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, anytime I say that, that's usually the, the first <laughs> response a person gives. So <laughs> thanks for being consistent. Um <laughs> Because I think that is the only association with the name Raymond that anybody knows. Um, so there's that listener. My name, middle name is Raymond. Married to my wife, Jenny. We've been married for four and a half years. Uh, yes. No no kiddos at this point. Uh, we have a wonderful dog named Eli, who's a white English lab, who is oh. just uh, phenomenal. Other things about me, I was born in a hospital, um, <laughs> if you're interested in knowing that. Grew up in Dallas. Came to Austin, studied UT, was actually not a Christian uh, when I came to school. And so I actually got saved through the Austin Stone at the end of my freshman year of college. And so just went through that that process of consuming on the church and then finally started serving and then leading. And then at that point felt, you know, a call into ministry, just seeing the transformation of what happened in my life when I became fully a part of the Bride of Christ and wanted to see that happen in the lives of other people too. So I am a homegrown Austin Stone. It is literally my only church experience, and uh, I love my church, uh, and I love being a part of it. So yeah, we've been in Austin now, I guess, 10 years or so. So did you did you meet Jenny at Austin Stone or at UT? How did you guys get connected? Yep, yep. We met uh, through serving in the, the students' ministry. Dude, that and, is uh, such a story. I was like... Oh yeah, I, I was at that place, and I think it's a lot uh, true for a lot of young, young Christian dudes who like come to faith, who are like, it's just me and Jesus, like that's <laughs> yeah. forever. Like, just take me to Ethiopia, here we go. <laughs> and then I start serving in the student ministry, and I'm like, but that girl's really cute, so feel super called here now. But yeah, we met serving in students. 
Dude, so set, tell us what was the what was the first interaction like? I'm I'm pretty curious. What does a single marshal do to make a connection with Jenny? Like, what's the line that that really hooked her? That man, first date. What was it? Yeah, you just walk right up to her, look her in the eyes, say, "Hey, we both have brown eyes," <laughs> uh, and you just see where it goes from there. No, but what's 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 funny with Jenny is like I actually uh, I asked her out multiple times, and she just straight up said no, like. Like I pursued her and she was just like, nah. And I just gave no regard to it. Just moved, <laughs> just stiff arm. Uh, so it was like my, my persistent widow kind of illustration. <laughs> like it eventually worked out, man. Cause she's locked in. <laughs> you were the persistent widow, man. I love that's it. That's right. Hey man, that's a great, if you're a single man out there, that's, there you go. But I've also known where that persistent widow really takes on a, a – it's like you really need the Holy Spirit involved in that. Otherwise, you could get like a restraining order or something like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, no, like it was uh, definitely her being gracious at some point. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, for also those 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 young guys out there, eventually you get enough nose to move on. But uh, it worked out for me. Dude, I love it. What's your – Marshall, do you know what your Enneagram number is? Are you into that? I'm a, I'm a one – which means that you probably either love or hate Enneagram as a one. And I find myself on the not really enjoying it, but mm. uh, it is shockingly accurate at times, which is always oh. funny. Well, I am a one as well. So maybe there, there's our connection right there. Boom. That's great. We actually just did a podcast, our last one that dropped because we're recording this in early September. So we had an Enneagram podcast. And we had a, a, a girl here who's in a woman here in uh, Dallas that's kind of a – I just say uh, kind of like our local expert on it, and she dove into mine, which is a one, and then Kylie, who is my former co-host, she's a seven. So, anyways, it's pretty interesting. Awesome, you have to go check it out. Well, we're going to get into talking about navigating faith and politics, but before we do that, Marshall, I've got some rapid fire questions for you here. We're going to go set up my clock here for thirty seconds. I've got six questions, although I think you can definitely answer all six in thirty seconds, easy. Love it. There we go. Get the clock out. 30 seconds in three, two, and one. Dallas Cowboys 2020 record. 11 and five. Most annoying Christian phrase. It's a God thing. Dallas Mavericks 2021 record. Assuming we play the full 84 games, we will go 48 and what is math there? 36. One thing you nerd out on the most. Smoking meat. C.D. Lamb's stat line for 2020. 988 yards, seven touchdowns. Pumpkin spice latte or hot chocolate? Hot chocolate. Awesome, awesome. C.D. Lamb does not break through 1,000-yard barrier. As much as I want him to, uh, I just think with our, I mean, our receiving core is just phenomenal. So, yeah, I think it'll come down to Dak, if anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, I saw Coop is down and out today but anyways nobody's coming to listen to that so let's get moving here all right man so 2020 crazy year of covid crazy year of just uh just i would say it's a polarizing year because you have covid happens people feel differently about it then you have a lot of the racial tension happens a lot of people feel different about that and then now just to on top of that, it's uh, an election year. So I feel like this has been such a polarizing year in a lot of ways. And I, I think even when you look at culture, there's this increasing amount of people wanting to know where you stand and kind of drawing lines in the sand. And it's really this, um, at least maybe I feel like this, maybe it's not as much, but I, I guess in the as I look at social media and the news, it's very much this mentality. You're kind of with us, you're against us, you're in or you're out. And, and this is especially true in, in the political atmosphere, which has really bled into and become a hot topic within churches. And so, you know, it doesn't take very long for you to scroll through social media and all these things to kind of see all these things fleshing themselves out. And in fact, I think it could be, you know, super overwhelming. And I, one of the things that I've noticed is this leaves ministry leaders in like a super tough spot. You know, because you have one, they're all over the spectrum when it comes to uh, political stances, and also they're ministering to people that are all over uh, the spectrum on it when it comes to political stances. And and then you have some uh, ministry leaders that kind of choose to say, "Hey, I'm, I'm not in one camp, I'm not in another, I'm in a Jesus camp," and and they really kind of are torn and they don't know what to do. So 
that's kind of the the setting in the context at which we find ourselves in as as ministry leaders. And so, I want to ask, like, from an individual perspective, how does a ministry leader navigate? You know, and, and maybe not even ministry leader, maybe just as an individual who believes in Jesus Christ, navigate politics and faith, and do do they even coincide together? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And like, I, not only twenty twenty, and I'm definitely gonna answer your question, but I I was thinking about it, uh, not just in terms of 2020, but bro, think about it from like where we are in the past like century. And and we're living in one of the most tumultuous times really in like the past hundred years, because we're dealing with like a pandemic. So you have Mm -hmm. like a, a, a health crisis, which also has an economic crisis with millions of people who are out of jobs and trying to figure out work. And then on top of that, you have the, the social unrest that's happening with racial justice issues. And then, yeah, you throw all that with the, the controversial political climate in the middle of, of an election year. And so, yeah, this media and social media has it constantly being put right in front of every person in America, mm-hmm. which means like our, our culture right now is an, is an incredibly fertile place for chaos. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing that everywhere. Everything is totally chaotic. Yeah. And so we as people, both believers and non-believers, when we experience chaos, or another way to put it, when we experience pressure, mm-hmm. our first instinct is always going to resort to pragmatism, mm. meaning what do I need to do in order to change my circumstances to get rid of this pressure? Yeah. And you see this all the time in young leaders in the church today uh, with like, you know, the classic case of burnout. Mm-hmm. You know, for whatever reason, they find themselves in a place where they feel uh, burned out. And typically what the first response is, is like, I need to take a step back from X, Y, Z. And the problem is, though, is that uh, pragmatism isn't a guarantee to solve the problem. Maybe that leader does need to take a step back, and there are good reasons for that. But maybe he or she is just feeling burned out because there really needs to be some heart repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the issue is you're isn't you're doing too much, but you're doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So I say all that because to your point about how everybody is so quickly going to take sides and argue is because as we find ourselves in the middle of chaos, we feel the pressure of 2020. And on paper, politics seems most pragmatic. Mm. The, the, the message on both sides is constantly, here's how I, or here's how my party will fix this. And here's how or why the other party won't. Yeah. And so as we feel the pressure, picking sides seems like those are the only options. Uh, but not only... Do I think that there are other options? I think that picking sides is for sure a dangerous option, Mm -hmm. uh, which is something that we're going to keep talking about. And so when you ask, like, from an individual perspective, how how does a ministry leader navigate politics and faith? I think this is a great question because you're framing it from from an individual perspective. Because before you are a leader in ministry, before I'm a leader in ministry— we're children of God and followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so before we even talk about how you can help other believers in this topic, uh, we have to have a personal, we have a personal duty to consider it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would say we need to remember that our entire allegiance is to Jesus and the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, that statement is kind of like a, a, a political statement. It's a political party. Yep. Jesus is a king, and, mm-hmm. and he has an agenda to establish his kingdom here on earth. Uh, and so when I think about it, Mitch, like G- when Jesus tells us in, in John 18 that his kingdom is not of this world, uh, that means that the kingdom of God is above and beyond and greater than the Democratic and Republican parties in America. Mm-hmm which necessarily means that both sides of those parties fall short of the kingdom of God. And so I believe that all Christians should be able to affirm and criticize components of both political parties. And to put it more directly, I think it would be like uh, unwise to wholesale devote yourself to a political party, uh, unless you're willing to say that the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or third party perfectly reflects the kingdom of God, which I don't think anybody would argue. And so Jesus saying my kingdom is not of this world means that we as a church shouldn't hitch our wagon to one political party or another. And if you do, then I think we're necessarily saying that X party, X or Y party is the kingdom of God. 
So I, I hope that's making sense. But that's what I think we have to do first is to consider it uh, like where my primary allegiance is as an individual. And that's to Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And my allegiance is not to one party or the other. Mm. Man, that's good. I, you know, as you're sitting there, you know, and I, I'm identifying with a lot of what you're saying. I think a lot of our leaders are as well, because most of the the folks that listen to this podcast are uh, millennials or like super um, early Gen Z, and I think they find themselves in. And I, for for me, is sometimes you find yourselves in political no man's land where you kind of look at both, and then even the leadership or even the the party, and you're like, man, I don't know that. You know, you're like, I don't know that I completely align with everything. There are some things I agree with, some things I don't. And then you're just kind of find yourself in no man's land. And it's like, wow, what do I, what do I do here? Because there's things, you know, about each one that you, you kind of value. And so, but then you hear this, this kind of line where it's like, well, if you don't vote for one party, you're voting for the other. And I, I think for a lot of, and I, there's this big emphasis on voting. And, and I'm wondering if even, that the reason why the voting has been down prior is because people really feel like, and especially young people is like, I don't know that I really identify with anything. And so there's this kind of like, well, I just won't do anything then, or I, I won't vote. So what do you think as far as if you don't vote for one party, you vote for the other, is that really true? Or how, how does that, how do you navigate that struggle of like, man, I don't want to sign my name to something. I don't want to check something that I don't wholeheartedly believe in, because I think that is a mark of, millennials and, and the generation Z is that we want to align our values to our practice. And that's kind of hard to do during this time. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great question, but I think because like you're saying, most Christians would find themselves kind of in that no man's land or middle ground. It's because they can look to both parties and probably see here are things that I would actually affirm. And here are things that I would criticize, mm -hmm. which means that like, there's no perfect vote. Yeah. Right. Yep. And so the, the good thing to look out for would be that even if you find yourself voting for one side or the other or identifying yourself as Democrat or Republican right now, you should always 100 percent be able to say, yes, I voted Democrat or I voted Republican, but I can look at the other side and see areas where they are right. And here's some areas where my side got it wrong. Yeah. Because neither of them are yeah. perfectly reflecting the the, mm. the Christian ethic and the kingdom of God, mm. but but to that statement of like if you, if you don't vote for one party, you're voting for another. I think there there are a couple of like problems with that mindset and that statement. Like, well, first, just call it what it is. Logically, it doesn't really make sense. It's trying to make a necessary truth that's not there. Like, you mm. can't say that to not vote Republican means you are voting Democrat or vice versa. The only vote that counts for a Democrat is if you vote Democrat and same for mm. Republicans, <laughs> if you vote yeah. Republicans or the third party. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, that there's a – I don't think manipulative is the right word, but that statement seems a little unfair because it, mm. it – I feel like it breeds a sense of shame. Yeah. And like for, for a younger believer, that can be like a, a guilt tactic into mm. getting someone to vote one way by like binding their conscience, which is something that we'll, we'll speak to later. But the reason why, Mitch, I think statements like that are made when a person is saying, I'm in no man's land, but there's some reason, there's something's coming to the front of their mind that makes them feel like if I don't vote for this, then I'm voting for that, uh, which kind of brings up that single issue voting question, which says like, as a Christian, there are things that are so foundational that you should vote for one party solely because of that one issue. For Christians, it's always going to like the issues of, of human rights and typically like, you know, the classic case of, of abortion and being pro-life. And so the argument would go because right now the Republican Party is pro-life on the topic of abortion, Christians should then vote Republican. And if you mm. don't, then you're basically casting your vote for the Democratic Party. Mm. But the issue with that example is that it's the same for all other single issue voting. Mm -hmm. Neither party perfectly reflects the things Christians stand for. Mm -hmm. And as Christians, like we have to care about all things, mm -hmm. not just some things. Yep. We have to care for the poor. We care for the immigrant, the refugee, the mm -hmm. unborn, mm -hmm. black lives, brown lives. Mm -hmm. All of those matter because they are all people made in the image of God. And both parties right now are split in terms of who is emphasizing what of those different categories. Yeah. And so to answer your question, I think Christians should feel the tension and struggle because we can't wholesale one party or the other 
And we can't be people that just make it a matter of single issue voting Mm -hmm. because your single issue might be different than my single issue. And there's no way we could argue which one is more important Mm -hmm. than the other when you're talking about things that Christians both recognize have infinite value. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, as I, as I, you know, even that question, if you don't vote for one, you're voting for the other. And I totally agree. I think there is a lot of, you know, instantly that kind of, you instantly feel guilt and shame on that, which I don't think that is obviously of the Lord, you know, and I, and I think what the, what the hard part about that is that it's almost, there, there's just increased tribalism in our nation to where there's so much kind of, I'm right, you're wrong, you're in or you're out. If you're, you know, if it, it, it's, it's like, you, you feel like you got to pick a side and, and, and the truth is, and, and the point I think you, you've gotten at is that, you know, really is a, as a Christian, there's nothing that's going to fully align. So there's always going to be some type of crossover that's kind of happening in that. And that's the tension that we have to live in, especially in this, um, in our society today. So that's, that's good. Well, well, how, uh, how involved do you think a ministry leader should be in, in public politics? Should, should you just kind of keep silent because you're ministering to people on both sides, perhaps, or should you be vocal about it? You know, and is there an example of maybe someone that you know that's actually done this pretty well? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll say this, and, and I kind of mentioned earlier with that, like uh, issues or, or matters of conscience. Um, I think Romans 14 is, is really key here for us as ministry leaders. Uh, because basically the point of Romans 14 is what we would call, you know, it's addressing issues of conscience. In Romans 14, Paul's basically making the argument that a Christian cannot bind the conscience of another person on things that are not like explicitly addressed in scripture. Basically, he's talking about gray areas, that for Christians, there, there are an abundance of things where one Christian can choose X, the other can choose Y, and both be okay and permissible Mm. before the Lord. And so when we're talking about a Christian leader's engagement in politics within their ministry, I would say that unless you're able to to find a passage that explicitly says to be a Christian means you have to vote X, Y, Z, or you have to support X, Y, Z, then we should as leaders realize uh, that the people in your ministry have freedom to have different political viewpoints because uh, it's not a matter of you become you being a Christian or not. Hmm. Both are permissible, yeah. saved by by grace through faith. Yeah. But one passage that I think is like a refrain for should be a refrain for all Christians, but I think Christian leaders in particular is in, in Acts twenty four uh, when Paul has a line where he says. Uh, I strive to make every effort to have a clear conscience before God and man. And I think this is a great goal for Mm -hmm. uh, Christian leaders uh, and how we help people navigate politics. Because if we would say there is gray area that because we're in this no man's land where neither reflect the kingdom of God and we can't make it a single issue thing and we can't go wholesale that you're going to have Christians that vote Democrat. You're going to have Christians that vote uh, Republican then we should help speak to and be thoughtful to that process in a way where we help the individuals come to their own conclusions so that they can have a clear conscience before God and their neighbors, friends, and family with how they voted and how they or didn't vote uh, and how they navigate their own political views. Hmm. You know, I was, I was just reading Jonathan Lehman's book, uh, how the is it how the nations rage i think that's what it's it's called yeah. and you know one of the things that he says in there because i i typically if if i'm gonna face i like to move forward on things that I'm, I'm not big on on just kind of i don't know i don't know i'm probably not making sense here but like i don't like conflict in the fact that it it, it i feel like it impedes progress even though it does conflict can actually be can lead to good things, which allows you to progress. But it's like, I don't like things that hold me up from like moving forward. And I feel like, right. and, and when it comes to politics, it's one of those things that it's, you're, 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 if you're going to address, or you're going to talk about this within a ministry setting or with people, it's, it's really going to create, it could create conflict and things like that. But one of the things that he says is, he says, actually the church should, 
should basically be the center of, of really, you know, believers in there as they're, they're learning the way of God's kingdom I actually have a lot to say about politics as far as the things that we need to champion for when it comes to in the government. And I thought that was a really, you know, I, I guess that that really makes sense. But part of me is just always thought like, man, that's just not something that I even want to dive into because it's just too messy, especially within a church setting, because I don't want to upset somebody. I don't want to step on any toes. I don't want to, you know, offend someone and all those kind of things. So I guess it just takes, as far as the ministry leader, just the right tact to, to address that, especially to both parties. So, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I think you're totally right. I think it's I mean, a ministry leader should be teaching their people what the the kingdom ethic is, Mm -hmm. right? And like we be able to see in ways that the the kingdom of God is not established here on this earth. And then how we as people of the church who want to see that established and realizing that the government is a vehicle in which that can happen. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't outsource our call as a church to establish the kingdom of God wholly Mm -hmm. to the government. But it is a, a means in which some things can be done that promote good and human flourishing and, and, and whatnot. But I think because there's gray area, a ministry leader should do his thoughtful job maybe of informing what the kingdom ethic is about certain topics. But I think they should be cautious about prescribing what the believers mm-hmm. should do in terms of how they engage politically yeah. themselves. You know, I, I wonder if this is just something that came to my mind as you're, as you're sharing that from a from a, I'm just thinking of a church leadership perspective, you know, if you have a church that is, you know, because the reality is, is everyone, if everyone is, is in your church, believer, and dwelt with the Holy Spirit, then they have the ability to be led by the Holy Spirit to make decisions for themselves. And I wonder if in some ways, some of this has gotten a little bit out of hand, because we tend to just take our cues from someone from on stage and really kind of not own that ourselves and, and, and kind of walk that out. But I don't know. I mean, I always think that sometimes that's, you know, allowing being mature enough in a, in a ministry setting to say, Hey man, here's, here's the kingdom. This is what God values. And now you have the liberty, like we're not telling you what to do, but you have the liberty to make that decision kind of on your own. Yeah. And I, I think that's where, like, what I mentioned earlier, coupling that Romans 14 and and Acts 24 about like, uh, let's be thoughtful to help inform our people, but then realize that they they can make their own independent decisions. And we want them to be able to do that with a clear conscience, knowing like, yeah, there are things in the other party that I don't stand for. And there are things in my party that like they're getting wrong Mm -hmm. uh, because neither perfectly reflect the kingdom of God, but I can have a clear conscience in this matter right now. That's good. Well, what have you guys, because I know even with, you know, with one of the things with ministry leaders now in the season of in, in COVID, as you know, you got people that are, you know, it's no big deal. You got some people that are very serious about it, and that's creating friction in churches on just opening, not opening, gathering, not gathering. Um, and then even with, you know, the, the political season now, too, how in you being over groups, how have um, how have you guys gone about addressing kind of helping shepherd people in this kind of season or what are some things that, you know, a leader might do about addressing politics within their ministry? What would you kind of, any kind of wisdom or anything you guys have done that you'd like to share? Um, man, the refrain, I think how we've been trying to navigate particularly, um, gathering and groups and how groups meet and whatnot is we want to be safe and we want to be wise. And so you, you have a, you know, a mixed bag of things in play here. You have like, that the people of God were always meant to gather in person. Mm-hmm. Nobody would argue. And so on one end, you're like, well, then let's try and do it sooner than later. But the other side of that is a stewardship of, of health, right? And wanting to be wise. And like, if you can't do it safely, you shouldn't, right? Mm-hmm. And then the aspect of Romans 13 in like, you know, the political aspect of our local authorities are a governing body over us that God has ordained to promote good. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have to listen to the, our local authorities and our state authorities and our federal authorities about uh, what they're saying we can and can't do and should and shouldn't do. And so it takes a lot of thoughtfulness and tying all of those threads together in a way where you can say, Uh, Is this decision that we're making about gathering, about groups, about what they talk about, 
safe and wise considering all the circumstances. Hmm. And a lot of times it looks different for different groups because yeah. uh, some groups can gather in person right now if they can do it safely and wisely and outdoors and other groups don't feel comfortable doing that. And me as a MC director, I'm not prescribing uh, what groups should do at this point because hmm. I think it's fair for them to uh, consider all those things and then choose for themselves. That's good, man. Well, man, what are some resources that may have been helpful for you or maybe helpful for other, you know, ministry leaders, particularly collegiate ministry leaders, anything that you would offer or uh, suggest? Yeah, man, I think uh, I'll start with the Bible because I think that is probably the best one. <laughs> if I could have like a wah, 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 kind of sound, <laughs> I, 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 I would say 2 Timothy 2, 22 through, through 26 is just crucial for for all of us right now because it, it's paul talking about uh fleeing youthful passions but then he gets into that don't be involved in foolish ignorant controversies which are all around us today mm -hmm. with covid with like everything uh, there are so many different quarrels that we can engage in he yeah. specifically addresses that he's saying don't be involved in foolish ignorant controversies why because the lord's servant should not be quarrelsome mm. and that's incredibly important because Coral Sim is what we're surrounded by. Yeah. yeah. All of our strong influential leaders right now are currently leading with quarrelsomeness yeah. on the political side, right? On both sides, it's mm -hmm. abundantly clear that there's more talk about how the other side is wrong uh, than there is a clear, thoughtful presentation of what they stand for. It is only finger pointing. And so yeah. uh, that's influencing us. Mm -hmm. It's like setting a public model for how to engage strong leadership is just fight. But this passage is saying, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And so we as Christians need to realize as we talk about politics, if how you go about it results in quarrels, then we're going about it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And he says, he goes on to say, instead of being quarrelsome, we should be, we should show kindness to all. Mm -hmm. And that's profoundly difficult because if the world is quarrelsome and all the inputs we're receiving are aggressive and combative, uh, then kindness in response is going to be viewed uh, in the eyes of the world as weak. Like as Christians are weak in the or kind in the midst of a quarrelsome world, the world is going to think that we're just weak and passive. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Yeah, because he goes on to say uh, we should be teaching and correcting. And so what Paul is saying is like showing kindness does not mean you don't teach. It's not meaning you don't correct. You do all those things, but you're patient and you're mm -hmm. kind and you're gentle. So I think that that is massive for us as Christians, and I would. If anybody's listening to this, go look at that passage, because one thing that blows my mind is that he says the outcome of this at the very end is that perhaps God may grant them repentance, mm -hmm. leading to a knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I think to the degree that we engage the world in this incredibly chaotic year and season will result and people actually coming to know Jesus Christ personally. And that is super fun to think about. Um, yeah. That it is, it is, if we're talking about politics being a means of establishing the kingdom of God, which is kind of where a lot of this argument comes from, well, this is saying, hey, how we actually engage people specifically in our context, those who don't know Jesus, how we engage them and talk about this in a non quarrelsome, gentle way is actually means where God grants them repentance. So that's the, the big Bible one. Uh, but then, man, I, I, I think as a, as a, as a true Baptist, uh, <laughs> I, I just admire how the ERLC is doing right now and, and Russell Moore and his team and the resources they're putting out. I think they've been profoundly helpful. Very good, uh, and, and I just, I love how they speak to this from a, a sober minded, mm -hmm. uh, non prescriptive kind of way that I've been talking about a, like, you can have people, Christians in different parts of the political spectrum, and you have to be willing to both uh, affirm and criticize your party and the other, wherever you identify. And so I would, I would rip up a lot of the stuff that they're putting out. Yeah, this stuff is really, really good and very, very helpful. In fact, that, you know, a few days ago, they put out an article, well, a few days ago, probably a week ago, they put out an article for some just kind of helpful books to dive into. We posted it on our SBTC Collegiate account. So if you're listening to this, go check it out. It's, it's, uh, go look through the feed. Uh, that article is on there, or you can just go to the ERLC website. So, 
Marshall, this has all been really super helpful. You know, I know that this is uh, this topic is kind of uh, awkward for a lot of folks and just even trying to navigate that. And, you know, even some ministry leaders that are, you know, don't even necessarily agree with their superiors when it comes to politics and things like that. Right. It can just be really tough to navigate. So appreciate you, man. I thought you uh, offered just a ton of wisdom and uh, insight and were super helpful into this. So thanks for thanks for jumping on, bro. Yep. Love it. Super fun. Go get them, planet Earth. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, thanks for listening to the Roundup Podcast. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, like, review a podcast. You can follow us on social media at SBTC Collegiate on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to join our Facebook group, Roundup Network. We have over 250 leaders that are there that you can share ideas, collaborate, ask questions. It's just a really good time. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>